Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This statement marks a halfway stage in the psalm, through the valley. It is though up to this point, the sheep have been boasting to an unfortunate neighbor across the fence about the excellent care that is received from its owner throughout the winter. Now it turns to address the shepherd directly. The personal pronouns I and you enter into the conversation. It becomes an intimate discourse of deep affection. This is natural and normal. The long treks into the high country for their summer range begin here left behind to those neglected sheep on the other side of the fence. Their summer will be spent in the close companionship and the solitary care of the Good Shepherd. Both in Palestine and in our own western sheep ranches, this division of the year is common practice. Most of the efficient shepherds endeavor to take their flocks onto distant summer ranges during the summer. This often entails long drives. The sheep move along very slowly, feeding as they go, gradually working their way up the mountains behind the receding snow. By late summer, they're well up on the remote alpine meadows above the timber line. With the approach of autumn, early snow settles on the highest ridges, relentlessly forcing the flocks to withdraw back down to lower elevations. As fall passes, the sheep are driven home to their ranch headquarters where they will spend the winter. It is a segment of the yearly operation that is described in the last half of this psalm. During this time, the flock is entirely alone with the shepherd. They are in intimate contact with him and under his most personal attention day and night. That is why these last verses are couched in such intimate first-person language. All of this is done against a dramatic backdrop of wild mountains, rushing rivers, alpine meadows, and high rangelands. David, the psalmist, of course knew this type of terrain firsthand. When Samuel was sent by God to anoint David king of Israel, David was not at home with his brothers on the home ranch. Instead, he was high up in the hills, tending his father's flocks during the summer. They had to send for him to come home. It's no wonder that he could write so clearly and concisely of the relationship between a sheep and its owner. He knew from firsthand experience about all the difficulties and dangers, as well as the delights of treks into the high country. Again and again, he had gone up into the summer range with his sheep. He knew this wild country like the palm of his own hand. Never did he take his flock where he had not been before. All the dangers of the 
rivers in flood, avalanches, rock slides, poisonous plants, the ravages of predators that raid the flock, or the awesome storms of sleet and hail and snow were familiar to him. He had handled the sheep and managed them with care under all of these conditions. Nothing took him by surprise. He was fully prepared to safeguard his flock and tend them with skill under every circumstance. All of this is brought out in the beautiful simplicity of the last verses. Here is an assurance that sets the soul at rest. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. With me in every situation, in every dark trial, in every disappointment, in every distressing dilemma, even in every joy. In the Christian life, people often speak of wanting to move onto higher ground with God. They want to get beyond the common crowd and enter a more intimate walk with God. We speak of mountaintop experiences, and we envy those who have ascended the heights and entered into this more sublime sort of life. Often we get an erroneous idea about how this takes place. It is though we imagined that we could be airlifted onto higher ground. On the rough trail of the Christian life, this is not so. As with ordinary sheep management, so with God's people. One only gets to the higher ground by climbing up through the valleys. Any shepherd familiar with high country knows this. He leads his flock gently, but persistently up the paths that wind through the dark valleys. It should be noticed that the verse states, yea, though I walk through, the, walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It does not say that I die there. It doesn't say that I stop there, but rather that I walk through. It is customary to use this verse as a consolation to those who are passing through the dark valley of death. But even here, for the child of God, death is not an end, but merely the door onto a higher and more exalted life of intimate contact with Christ. Death is but the dark valley opening into an eternity of delight with God. It is not something to fear, but an experience through which one passes on the path to a more perfect life. The Good Shepherd knows this. It is one reason why he told us, Lo, I am with you always, even in the valley of death. Keller was keenly aware of this consolation when his wife died. For two years, they had walked through the dark valley of death, watching her beautiful body being destroyed by cancer. As death approached, he sat by her bed, her hand in his. Gently, they passed through the valley of death. Both of them were quietly aware of Christ's presence. There was no fear, just a going on to higher ground. I remember... It may have been 10 years ago now, or nearing that, when I was asked to help a family determined to take their son off life support. He was not yet 30. And as I stood in the room with them after the life support was off, they were around the bed and I was standing in the back. And I felt very strange because my face just went into a smile and started beaming in the presence of his death. And all they're recognizing is that they're losing their son. But his mother spoke to me about that afterwards and the, the peace in the room as he was passing. For those of us here on earth, there is still a life to live here and now. 
There are still valleys to walk through during our remaining days. These not need be dead in streets. There will be disappointments and other things that go wrong in our life, but they are part of the pathway. They can be part of the road to the higher ground in our walk with God. After all, when we think about it a moment, we must realize that even our modern mountain highways follow the valleys to reach the summit of the passes that they travel. Similarly, the ways of God lead upward through the valleys in our own lives. Again and again we remind ourselves, Oh God, this seems terribly tough, but we know for a fact that in the end it will prove to be the best and gentlest way to get us to the higher ground. Then when we thank him for the difficult things, the dark days, we discover that he is there with us in our distress. At that point, our panic, our fear, our misgivings give way to calm and quiet confidence in his care. Somehow, in a serene, quiet way, we are assured all will turn out well for our best because he is with us individually in the valley, and things are under his control. To come to this conviction in the Christian life is to have entered into an attitude of quiet acceptance of every adversity. It is to have moved onto higher ground with God. Knowing him in a new and intimate manner makes life much more bearable than before. There is a second reason why sheep are taken to the mountaintops by way of the valleys. Not only is this the way of the gentlest grades, but it is also the well-watered route. Here one finds refreshing water all along the way. There are rivers, streams, springs, and even quiet pools in these valleys. During the summer months, long drives can be hot and tiresome. The flocks experience intense thirst. How glad they are for the frequent watering places along the valley route where they can be refreshed. As Christians, we will sooner or later discover that it is in the valleys of our lives that we find our refreshments with God himself. It is not until we have walked with him through some very deep troubles that we discover that He can lead us to find our refreshment in him right there in the middle of our difficulty. We are thrilled beyond words when restoration comes to our souls and spirits from his spirits. There are those who claim that they can't face such a situation, but a person who walks with God through these valleys Such real and actual refreshment is available in the midst. The corollary to this is that only those who have been through such dark valleys can console, comfort, or encourage others in similar situations. Often we pray or sing a hymn requesting God to make us an inspiration to someone else. We want, instinctively, to be a channel of blessing to other lives. Whether it's to help a student be the best that they can be, or to bring joy to life with flowers, we want to bring good to other people. The simple fact is that just as water can only flow in a ditch or a channel or a valley, so the life of God can only flow in blessing through the valleys that have been carved out and cut into our lives by sometimes excruciating experiences. For example, the one best able to comfort another in bereavement is the person who has himself lost a close loved one. The one who can best minister to a broken heart is one who has had their own heart broken. Most of us don't like these things happening to us in the valleys of our lives. We shrink from them with a sense of fear 
and foreboding. Yet in spite of our worst misgivings, God can bring great benefits and lasting blessing to others through those valleys. Let us not always try to avoid the dark things, the distressing days. They may well prove to be the way of greatest refreshment to ourselves and those around us. A third reason why the rancher chooses to take his flock into the high country by way of the valley is that this is generally where the richest feed and best forage is to be found along the route. The flock is moved along gently. They are not hurried. There are lambs along which have never been this way before. The shepherd wants to be sure that there will not only be water, but also the best grazing available for the ewes and their lambs. Generally, the choicest meadows are in these valleys along the stream banks. Here, the sheep can feed as they move toward the high country. Naturally, these grassy glades are often on the floor of steep-walled canyons and gulches. There may be towering cliffs above them on either side. The valley floor may be in a dark shadow, with the sun seldom reaching the bottom except for a few hours around noon. The shepherd knows from past experience that predators like coyotes, bears, wolves, or cougars can take cover in these broken cliffs and from their vantage point prey on his flock. He knows these valleys can be subject to sudden storms and flash floods that send walls of water rampaging down the slopes. There could be rock slides, mud or snow avalanches, and a dozen other natural disasters that would destroy or injure his sheep. But in spite of these hazards, he also knows that this is still the best way to take his flock to the high country. He spares himself no pain or trouble or time to keep his eye on the flock, to watch for any of these dangers that might develop. One of the most terrible threats is the sudden chilling storms of rain, sleet, and snow that can sweep down through the valleys from the mountain peaks. If sheep become soaked and chilled with a freezing rain, the exposure can kill them in a very short time. They are thin-skinned creatures, easily susceptible to colds, pneumonia, and other respiratory complications. Keller recalls one storm he went through in the foothills of the Rockies in early summer. The morning was bright and clear. Suddenly around noon, enormous dark, black, forbidding clouds began to sweep down over the hills from the north. A chilling wind accompanied the approaching storm. The sky grew darker by the hour. Suddenly in mid-afternoon, long streamers of rain and sleet began to sweep across the valley. He ran to take shelter in a clump of stunted, wind-blown spruce. The rain soaked through to his skin. As it fell, it cooled the whole country. The rain turned to sleet and to commingled snow and hail. In a short time, the whole mountain slope in mid-July was white and frozen. Ominous darkness shrouded the whole scene. The sheep sensed that the storm was approaching. Perhaps the flock would have perished if they had not raced to find shelter in the steep cliffs at the edge of the canyon. But in these valleys was where the grass grew best, and it was the best route to the high country. Our shepherd knows all of this when he leads us through the valleys. He knows where we can find strength and sustenance and gentle grazing despite every threat of disaster around us. It is the most assuring and reinforcing experience to the child of God to discover that there is, even in the dark valley, a source of strength and courage to be found in God. It is when he can look back over life 
and see how the shepherd's hand has guided and sustained him in the darkest hours that renewed faith is engendered. It is this spiritual as well as emotional and mental exposure to the storms and adversities of life that puts stamina into our very being. Because he led us through without fear before, he can do it again and again and again. In this knowledge, fear fades and tranquility of heart and mind takes its place. Let come what may. Storms may break out around us. Predators may attack. Rivers of reverses may threaten to inundate me. But because he is in the situation with us, we don't have to fear. Only the Christian who learns to live this way is able to encourage and inspire those around him. Too many of us get shaken up, frightened, and panicked by the storms of life. We claim to have confidence in Christ, but when the first dark shadows sweep over us and the path we tread looks gloomy, we go into a deep slump of despair. Sometimes we just feel like lying down to die. This is not as it should be. The person with a powerful confidence in Christ, the one who has proved by past experience that God is with him in adversity, the one who walks through life's dark valleys without fear, his head held high, is the one who in turn is a tower of strength and a source of inspiration to his companions. There are going to be some valleys in life for all of us. The good shepherd himself assured us that in this world you have tri will have tribulations, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world, John 16, 33. The basic question is not whether we have many or few valleys. It is not whether these valleys are dark or merely dim shadows. The question is, how do we react to them? How do we go through them? How do we cope with the calamities that come our way? With Christ, we can face them calmly. With his gracious spirit to guide us, we can face them fearlessly. Know of a surety that only through them can we possibly travel on to higher ground with God. In this way, not only shall we be blessed, but in turn, we will become a blessing to those around us.